but it will be said of this day that I slew twenty Sautokar by my own hand. Gurney followed with Stilgar, stepping on ground that he did not even feel. The cavern with its yellow light of glow-globes was forced out of his thoughts by rage. The she-witch alive, while those she betrayed are bones in lonesome graves. I must contrive it, that Paul learns the truth about her, before I slay her. How often it is that the angry man rages denial of what his inner self is telling him. The Collected Sayings of Muad'Dib by the Princess Irulan The crowd in the cavern assembly chamber radiated that pack feeling Jessica had sensed the day Paul killed Jameis. There was murmuring nervousness in the voices. Little cliques gathered like knots among the robes. Jessica tucked a message cylinder beneath her robe as she emerged to the ledge from Paul's private quarters. She felt rested after the long journey up from the south, but still rankled that Paul would not yet permit them to use the captured ornithopters. We do not have full control of the air, he had said, and we must not become dependent upon off-world fuel. Both fuel and aircraft must be gathered and saved for the day of maximum effort. Paul stood with a group of the younger men near the ledge. The pale light of glow-globes gave the scene a tinge of unreality. It was like a tableau, but with the added dimension of Warren smells, the whispers, the sounds of shuffling feet. She studied her son, wondering why he had not yet trotted out his surprise, Gurney Halleck. The thought of Gurney disturbed her with its memories of an easier past, days of love and beauty with Paul's father. Stilgar waited with a small group of his own at the other end of the ledge. There was a feeling of inevitable dignity about him, the way he stood without talking. We must not lose that man, Jessica thought. Paul's plan must work. Anything else would be the highest tragedy. She strode down the ledge, passing Stilgar without a glance, stepped down into the crowd. A way was made for her as she headed toward Paul, and silence followed her. She knew the meaning of the silence, the unspoken questions of the people, awe of the Reverend Mother. The young men drew back from Paul as she came up to him, and she found herself momentarily dismayed by the new deference they paid him. All men beneath your position covet your station, went the Bene Gesserit axiom. But she found no covetousness in these faces. They were held at a distance by the religious ferment around Paul's leadership. And she recalled another Bene Gesserit saying, Prophets have a way of dying by violence. Paul looked at her. It's time, she said, and passed the message cylinder to him. One of Paul's companions, bolder than the others, glanced across at Stilgar, said, are you going to call him out, Mardib? Now's the time for sure. They'll think you a coward if you... Who dares call me coward? Paul demanded. His hand flashed to his Chris knife hilt. Baited silence came over the group, spreading out into the crowd. There's work to do, Paul said as the man drew back from him. Paul turned away, shouldered through the crowd to the ledge, leaped lightly up to it and faced the people. Do it, someone shrieked. Murmurs and whispers arose behind the shriek. Paul waited for silence. It came slowly amidst scattered shufflings and coughs. When it was quiet in the cavern, Paul lifted his chin, spoke in a voice that carried to the farthest corners. "'You are tired of waiting,' Paul said. Again he waited while the cries of response died out. "'Indeed they are tired of waiting,' Paul thought. He hefted the message cylinder, thinking of what it contained." His mother had showed it to him, explaining how it had been taken from a Harkonnen courier. The message was explicit. Rabban was being abandoned to his own resources here on Arrakis. He could not call for help or reinforcements. Again Paul raised his voice. You think it's time I called out Stilgar and changed the leadership of the troops? Before they could respond, Paul hurled his voice at them in anger. Do you think the Lisan al-Gaib that stupid? There was stunned silence. 
He's accepting the religious mantle. Jessica thought he must not do it. It's the way, someone shouted. Paul spoke dryly, probing the emotional undercurrents. Ways change. An angry voice lifted from a corner of the cavern. We'll say what's to change. There were scattered shouts of agreement through the throng. As you wish, Paul said. And Jessica heard the subtle intonations as he used the powers of voice she had taught him. You will say, he agreed, but first you will hear my say. Stilgar moved along the ledge, his bearded face impassive. That is the way, too, he said. The voice of any Fremen may be heard in council. Paul Muad'Dib is a Fremen. The good of the tribe, that is the most important thing, eh? Paul asked. Still with that flat-voiced dignity, Stilgar said, Thus our steps are guided. All right, Paul said. Then who rules this troop of our tribe? And who rules all the tribes and troops through the fighting instructors we've trained in the weirding way? Paul waited, looking over the heads of the throng. No answer came. Presently he said, Does Stilgar rule all this? He says himself that he does not. Do I rule? Even Stilgar does my bidding on occasion, and the sages, the wisest of the wise, listen to me and honor me in council. There was shuffling silence among the crowd. So, Paul said, does my mother rule? He pointed down to Jessica in her black robes of office among them. Stilgar and all the other troop leaders ask her advice in almost every major decision. You know this. But does a reverend mother walk the sand, or lead a razia against the Harkonnens? Frowns creased the foreheads of those Paul could see, but still there were angry murmurs. This is a dangerous way to do it, Jessica thought, but she remembered the message cylinder and what it implied. And she saw Paul's intent, go right to the depth of their uncertainty, dispose of that, and all the rest must follow. No man recognizes leadership without the challenge and the combat, eh? Paul asked. That's the way, someone shouted. What's our goal? Paul asked, to unseat Raban, the Harkonnen beast, and remake our world into a place where we may raise our families in happiness amidst an abundance of water. Is this our goal? Hard tasks need hard ways, someone shouted. Do you smash your knife before a battle? Paul demanded. I say this as fact, not meaning it as boast or challenge. There isn't a man here, Stilgar included who could stand against me in single combat. This is Stilgar's own admission. He knows it. So do you all. Again the angry mutters lifted from the crowd. Many of you have been with me on the practice floor, Paul said. You know this isn't idle boast. I say it because it's fact known to us all, and I'd be foolish not to see it for myself. I began training in these ways earlier than you did, and my teachers were tougher than any you've ever seen. How else do you think I bested Jameis at an age when your boys are still fighting only mock battles? He's using the voice well, Jessica thought, but that's not enough with these people. They've good insulation against vocal control. He must catch them also with logic. So, Paul said, we come to this. He lifted the message cylinder, removed its scrap of tape. This was taken from a Harkonnen courier. Its authenticity is beyond question. It is addressed to Raban. It tells him that his request for new troops is denied, that his spice harvest is far below quota, that he must wring more spice from Arrakis with the people he has. Stilgar moved up beside Paul. How many of you see what this means? Paul asked. Stilgar saw it immediately. They're cut off, someone shouted. Paul pushed message and cylinder into his sash. From his neck he took a braided shiga wire cord and removed a ring from the cord, holding the ring aloft. This was my father's ducal signet, he said. I swore never to wear it again, until I was ready to lead my troops over all of Arrakis and claim it as my rightful fief. He put the ring on his finger, clenched his fist. Utter stillness gripped the cavern. "'Who rules here?' Paul asked. He raised his fist. "'I rule here,' 
I rule on every square inch of Arrakis. This is my ducal fief, whether the emperor says yea or nay. He gave it to my father, and it comes to me through my father. Paul lifted himself onto his toes, settled back to his heels. He studied the crowd, feeling their temper. Almost, he thought. There are men here who will hold positions of importance on Arrakis when I claim those imperial rights which are mine, Paul said. Stilgar is one of those men. Not because I wish to bribe him. Not out of gratitude, though I'm one of many here who owe him life for life. No, but because he's wise and strong, because he governs this troop by his own intelligence and not just by rules. Do you think me stupid? Do you think I'll cut off my right arm and leave it bloody on the floor of this cavern just to provide you with a circus? Paul swept a hard gaze across the throng. Who is there here to say I'm not the rightful ruler on Arrakis? Must I prove it by leaving every Fremen tribe in the Erg without a leader? Beside Paul, Stilgar stirred, looked at him questioningly. Will I subtract from our strength when we need it most? Paul asked. I am your ruler, and I say to you that it is time we stopped killing off our best men and started killing our real enemies, the Harkonnens. In one blurred motion, Stilgar had his Chris knife out and pointed over the heads of the throng. Long live Duke Paul Muadib, he shouted. A deafening roar filled the cavern, echoed and re-echoed. They were cheering and chanting, Ya Hia Chuhada, Muadib, 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 Ya Hia Chuhada. Jessica translated it to herself, Long live the fighters of Muadib. The scene she and Paul and Stilgar had cooked up between them had worked as they'd planned. The tumult died slowly. When silence was restored, Paul faced Stilgar, said, Kneel, Stilgar. Stilgar dropped to his knees on the ledge. Hand me your Chris knife, Paul said. Stilgar obeyed. This was not as we planned it, Jessica thought. Repeat after me, Stilgar, Paul said, and he called up the words of investiture as he had heard his own father use them. I, Stilgar, take this knife from the hands of my duke. I, Stilgar, take this knife from the hands of my duke, Stilgar said, and accepted the milky blade from Paul. Where my duke commands, there shall I place this blade, Paul said. Stilgar repeated the words, speaking slowly and solemnly. Remembering the source of the right, Jessica blinked back tears, shook her head. I know the reasons for this, she thought. I shouldn't let it stir me. I dedicate this blade to the cause of my duke and the death of his enemies for as long as our blood shall flow, Paul said. Stilgar repeated it after him. "'Kiss the blade,' Paul ordered. Silgar obeyed, then in the Fremen manner kissed Paul's knife arm. At a nod from Paul he sheathed the blade, got to his feet. A sighing whisper of awe passed through the crowd, and Jessica heard the words, "'The prophecy! A Bene Gesserit shall show the way, and a reverend mother shall see it!' And from farther away, "'She shows us through her son!' Stilgar leads this tribe, Paul said. Let no man mistake that. He commands with my voice. What he tells you, it is as though I told you. Wise, Jessica thought. The tribal commander must lose no face among those who should obey him. Paul lowered his voice, said, Stilgar, I want sandwalkers out this night, and Sialagos sent to summon a council gathering. When you've sent them, bring Chat, Korba, and Othame, and two other lieutenants of your own choosing. Bring them to my quarters for battle planning. We must have a victory to show the council of leaders when they arrive. Paul nodded for his mother to accompany him, led the way down off the ledge and through the throng toward the central passage and the living chambers that had been prepared there. As Paul pressed through the crowd, hands reached out to touch him, voices called out to him, "'My knife goes where Stilgar commands it, Paul Muadib. "'Let us fight soon, Paul Muadib. "'Let us wet our world with the blood of Harkonnens.' "'Feeling the emotions of the throng, "'Jessica sensed the fighting edge of these people. "'They could not be more ready. 
We are taking them at the crest, she thought. In the inner chamber, Paul motioned his mother to be seated, said, Wait here, and he ducked through the hangings to the side passage. It was quiet in the chamber after Paul had gone, so quiet behind the hangings that not even the faint soughing of the wind pumps that circulated air in the sietch penetrated to where she sat. He is going to bring Kearney Halleck here, she thought. And she wondered at the strange mingling of emotions that filled her. Gurney and his music had been a part of so many pleasant times on Caladan before the move to Arrakis. She felt that Caladan had happened to some other person. In the nearly three years since then she had become another person, having to confront Gurney forced a reassessment of the changes. Paul's coffee service, the fluted alloy of silver and jasmium that he had inherited from Jamis, rested on a low table to her right. She stared at it, thinking of how many hands had touched that metal. Chani had served Paul from it within the month. What can his desert woman do for a duke except serve him coffee? She asked herself. She brings him no power, no family. Paul has only one major chance, to ally himself with a powerful great house, perhaps even with the imperial family. There are marriageable princesses, after all, and every one of them Bene Gesserit trained. Jessica imagined herself leaving the rigors of Arrakis for the life of power and security she could know as mother of a royal consort. She glanced at the thick hangings that obscured the rock of this cavern cell, thinking of how she had come here, riding amidst a host of worms, the palanquins and pack platforms piled high with necessities for the coming campaign. As long as Chani lives, Paul will not see his duty, Jessica thought. She has given him a son, and that is enough. A sudden longing to see her grandson, the child whose likeness carried so much of the grandfather's features, so like Leto, swept through her. Jessica placed her palms against her cheeks, began the ritual breathing that stilled emotion and clarified the mind then bent forward from the waist in the devotional exercise that prepared the body for the mind's demands. Paul's choice of this cave of birds as his command post could not be questioned, she knew. It was ideal. And to the north lay Wind Pass, opening onto a protected village in a cliff-walled sink. It was a key village, home of artisans and technicians, maintenance center for an entire Harkonnen defensive sector. A cough sounded. Outside the chamber hangings, Jessica straightened, took a deep breath, exhaled slowly. Enter, she said. Draperies were flung aside, and Gurney Halleck bounded into the room. She had only time for a glimpse of his face with its odd grimace, then he was behind her, lifting her to her feet with one brawny arm beneath her chin. Gurney, you fool, what are you doing? she demanded. Then she felt the touch of the knife tip against her back. Chill awareness spread out from that knife tip. She knew in that instant that Gurney meant to kill her. Why? She could think of no reason, for he wasn't the kind to turn traitor, but she felt certain of his intention. Knowing it, her mind churned. He was no man to be overcome easily. He was a killer, wary of the voice, wary of every combat stratagem, wary of every trick of death and violence. Here was an instrument she herself had helped train with subtle hints and suggestions. "'You thought you had escaped, eh, witch?' Gurney snarled. Before she could turn the question over in her mind or try to answer, the curtains parted and Paul entered. "'Here he is, ma—' Paul broke off, taking in the tensions of the scene. "'You will stand where you are, my lord,' Gurney said. "'What?' Paul shook his head. Jessica started to speak, felt the arm tighten against her throat. You will speak only when I permit it, witch, Gurney said. I want only one thing from you for your son to hear it, and I am prepared to send this knife into your heart by reflex at the first sign of a counter against me. Your voice will remain in a monotone. Certain muscles you will not tense or move. You will act with the most extreme caution to gain yourself a few more seconds of life. And I assure you, these are all you have. Paul took a step forward. Gurney, man, what is... Stop right where you are, Gurney snapped. One more step and she's dead. Paul's hand slipped to his knife hilt. He spoke in a deadly quiet. 
You had best explain yourself, Gurney. I swore an oath to slay the betrayer of your father, Gurney said. Do you think I can forget the man who rescued me from a Harkonnen slave pit? Gave me freedom, life and honour? Gave me friendship, a thing I prized above all else? I have his betrayer under my knife. No one can stop me from... You couldn't be more wrong, Gurney, Paul said. And Jessica thought, so that's it. What irony. Wrong am I, Gurney demanded. Let us hear it from the woman herself, and let her remember that I have bribed and spied and cheated to confirm this charge. I've even pushed Samuta and a Harkonnen guard captain to get part of the story. Jessica felt the arm at her throat ease slightly, but before she could speak, Paul said, The betrayer was Yui. I tell you this once, Gurney, the evidence is complete, cannot be controverted. It was Yui. I do not care how you came by your suspicion, for it can be nothing else, but if you harm my mother... Paul lifted his Chris knife from its scabbard, held the blade in front of him. I'll have your blood. Yui was a conditioned medic, fit for a royal house, Gurney snarled. He could not turn traitor. I know a way to remove that conditioning, Paul said. Evidence, Gurney insisted. The evidence is not here, Paul said. It's in Tabor Siech, far to the south, but if... This is a trick, Gurney snarled, and his arm tightened on Jessica's throat. No trick, Gurney, Paul said, and his voice carried such a note of terrible sadness that the sound tore at Jessica's heart. I saw the message captured from the Harkonnen agent, Gurney said. The note pointed directly at... I saw it too, Paul said. My father showed it to me the night he explained why it had to be a Harkonnen trick aimed at making him suspect the woman he loved. Ah, yeah, Gurney said. You've not... Be quiet, Paul said. And the monotone stillness of his words carried more command than Jessica had ever heard in another voice. He has the great control, she thought. Gurney's arm trembled against her neck. The point of the knife at her back moved with uncertainty. What you have not done, Paul said, is heard my mother sobbing in the night over her lost duke. You have not seen her eyes stab flame when she speaks of killing Harkonnens. So he has listened, she thought. Tears blinded her eyes. What you have not done, Paul went on, is remembered the lessons you learned in a Harkonnen slave pit. You speak of pride in my father's friendship. Didn't you learn the difference between Harkonnen and Atreides so that you could smell a Harkonnen trick by the stink they left on it? Didn't you learn that Atreides' loyalty is bought with love while the Harkonnen coin is hate? Couldn't you see through to the very nature of this betrayal? But Yui, Gurney muttered. The evidence we have is Yui's own message to us admitting his treachery, Paul said. I swear this to you by the love I hold for you, a love I will still hold even after I leave you dead on this floor. Hearing her son, Jessica marveled at the awareness in him, the penetrating insight of his intelligence. My father had an instinct for his friends, Paul said. He gave his love sparingly, but with never an error. His weakness lay in misunderstanding hatred. He thought anyone who hated Harkonnens could not betray him. He glanced at his mother. She knows this. I've given her my father's message that he never distrusted her. Jessica felt herself losing control, bit at her lower lip. Seeing the stiff formality in Paul, she realized what these words were costing him. She wanted to run to him, cradle his head against her breast as she never had done. But the arm against her throat had ceased its trembling, the knife point at her back pressed still and sharp. One of the most terrible moments in a boy's life, Paul said, is when he discovers his father and mother are human beings who share a love that he can never quite taste. It's a loss, an awakening to the fact that the world is there and here and we are in it alone. The moment carries its own truth. You can't evade it. I heard my father when he spoke of my mother. She's not the betrayer, Gurney. Jessica found her voice, said, Gurney, release me. There was no special command in the words, no trick to play on his weaknesses, but Gurney's hand fell away. 
She crossed to Paul, stood in front of him, not touching him. Paul, she said, there are other awakenings in this universe. I suddenly see how I've used you and twisted you and manipulated you to set you on a course of my choosing. A course I had to choose, if that's any excuse, because of my own training. She swallowed past a lump in her throat, looked up into her son's eyes. Paul, I want you to do something for me. Choose the course of happiness. Your desert woman, marry her if that's your wish. Defy everyone and everything to do this, but choose your own course. I... She broke off, stopped by the low sound of muttering behind her. Gurney. She saw Paul's eyes directed beyond her, turned. Gurney stood in the same spot but had sheathed his knife, pulled the robe away from his breast to expose the slick grayness of an issue still suit, the type the smugglers traded for among the Sietchwarans. Put your knife right here in my breast, Gurney muttered. I say kill me and have done with it. I've besmirched my name. I've betrayed my own duke. The finest... Be still, Paul said. Gurney stared at him. Close that robe and stop acting like a fool, Paul said. I've had enough foolishness for one day. Kill me, I say, Gurney raged. You know me better than that, Paul said. How many kinds of an idiot do you think I am? Must I go through this with every man I need? Gurney looked at Jessica, spoke in a forlorn, pleading note so unlike him. Then you, my lady, please, you kill me. Jessica crossed to him, put her hands on his shoulders. Gurney, why do you insist the Atreides must kill those they love? Gently she pulled the spread robe out of his fingers, closed and fastened the fabric over his chest. Gurney spoke brokenly. But I... You thought you were doing a thing for Leto, she said, and for this I honor you. My lady, Gurney said. He dropped his chin to his chest, squeezed his eyelids closed against the tears. Let us think of this as a misunderstanding among old friends, she said. And Paul heard the soothers, the adjusting tones in her voice. It's over and we can be thankful we'll never again have that sort of misunderstanding between us. Gurney opened eyes bright with moisture, looked down at her. The Gurney Halleck I knew was a man adept with both blade and balisset, Jessica said. It was the man of the balisset I most admired. Doesn't that Gurney Halleck remember how I used to enjoy listening by the hour while he played for me? Do you still have a balisset, Gurney? I have a new one, Gurney said. Brought from Chusuk, a sweet instrument, plays like a genuine Varota, though there's no signature on it. I think myself it was made by a student of Varotas who... He broke off. What can I say to you, my lady? He we prattle about. Not prattle, Gurney, Paul said. He crossed to stand beside his mother, eye to eye with Gurney. Not prattle, but a thing that brings happiness between friends. I'd take it a kindness if you'd play for her now. Battle planning can wait a little while. We'll not be going into the fight till tomorrow at any rate. I, I'll get my balisset. Kearney said. It's in the passage. He stepped around them and through the hangings. Paul put a hand on his mother's arm, found that she was trembling. It's over, mother, he said. Without turning her head, she looked up at him from the corners of her eyes. Over? Of course, Gurney's... Gurney, oh, yes. She lowered her gaze. The hangings rustled as Gurney returned with his balisset. He began tuning it, avoiding their eyes. The hangings on the walls dulled the echoes, making the instrument sound small and intimate. Paul led his mother to a cushion, seated her there with her back to the thick draperies of the wall. He was suddenly struck by how old she seemed to him, with the beginnings of desert-dried lines in her face, the stretching at the corners of her blue-veiled eyes. She's tired, he thought. We must find some way to ease her burdens. Gurney strummed a chord. Paul glanced at him, said, I've things that need my attention. Wait here for me. Gurney nodded. 
His mind seemed far away, as though he dwelled for this moment beneath the open skies of Caladan, with cloud fleece on the horizon promising rain. Paul forced himself to turn away, let himself out through the heavy hangings over the side passage. He heard Gurney take up a tune behind him, and paused a moment outside the room to listen to the muted music. Orchards and vineyards, and full-breasted houris, and a cup overflowing before me, why do I babble of battles, and mountains reduced to dust, why do I feel these tears? Heavens stand open and scatter their riches. My hands need but gather their wealth. Why do I think of an ambush and poison in molten cup? Why do I feel my years? Love's arms beckon with their naked delights, and Eden's promise of ecstasies. Why do I remember the scars, dream of old transgressions, and why do I sleep with fears? A robed Fedekin courier appeared from a corner of the passage ahead of Paul. The man had hood thrown back and fastenings of his still suit hanging loose about his neck, proof that he had come just now from the open desert. Paul motioned for him to stop, left the hangings of the door, and moved down the passage to the courier. The man bowed, hands clasped in front of him the way he might greet a reverend mother or say Adina of the rites. He said, Muadib, leaders are beginning to arrive for the council. So soon? These are the ones Stilgar sent for earlier when it was thought... He shrugged. I see. Paul glanced back toward the faint sound of the ballast, thinking of the old song that his mother favored, an odd stretching of happy tune and sad words. Stilgar will come here soon with others. Show them where my mother waits. I will wait here, Muad'Dib, the courier said. Yes, yes, do that. Paul pressed past the man toward the depths of the cavern, headed for the place that each such cavern had, a place near its water-holding basin. There would be a small shy holod in this place, a creature no more than nine meters long, kept stunted and trapped by surrounding water ditches. The maker, after emerging from its little maker, Vector, avoided water for the poison it was. And the drowning of a maker was the greatest Fremen secret because it produced the substance of their union, the water of life, the poison that could only be changed by a reverend mother. The decision had come to Paul while he faced the tension of danger to his mother. No line of the future he had ever seen carried that moment of peril from Gurney Halleck. The future, the grey cloud future, with its feeling that the entire universe rolled toward a boiling nexus hung around him like a phantom world. I must see it, he thought. His body had slowly acquired a certain spice tolerance that made prescient visions fewer and fewer, dimmer and dimmer. The solution appeared obvious to him. I will drown the maker. We will see now whether I'm the Kwisatz Haderach, who can survive the test that the Reverend Mothers have survived. This ends Disc 17. Dune, Disc 18. And it came to pass in the third year of the Desert War that Paul Muad'Dib lay alone in the cave of birds beneath the Kiswa hangings of an inner cell. And he lay as one dead, caught up in the revelation of the water of life, his being translated beyond the boundaries of time by the poison that gives life. Thus was the prophecy made true that the Lisan al-Gaib might be both dead and alive. Collected Legends of Arrakis by the Princess Irulan. Chani came up out of the Habanya Basin in the pre-dawn darkness, hearing the thopter that had brought her from the south go whirring off to a hiding place in the vastness. Around her the escort kept its distance, fanning out into the rocks of the ridge to probe for dangers, and giving the mate of Muad'Dib, the mother of his firstborn, the thing she had requested, a moment to walk alone. Why did he summon me? she asked herself. He told me before that I must remain in the south with little Leto and Alia. 
She gathered her robe and leaped lightly up across a barrier rock and onto the climbing path that only the desert trained could recognize in the darkness. Pebbles slithered underfoot, and she danced across them without considering the nimbleness required. The climb was exhilarating, easing the fears that had fermented in her because of her escort's silent withdrawal and the fact that a precious thopter had been sent for her. She felt the inner leaping at the nearness of reunion with Paul Moadib, her usul. His name might be a battle cry over all the land, Moadib, 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 but she knew a different man by a different name, the father of her son, the tender lover. A great figure loomed out of the rocks above her, beckoning for speed. She quickened her pace. Dawn birds already were calling and lifting into the sky. A dim spread of light grew across the eastern horizon. The figure above was not one of her own escort. Othaim, she wondered, marking a familiarity of movement and manner. She came up to him, recognized in the growing light the broad, flat features of the Fedekin lieutenant, his hood open and mouth filter loosely fastened the way one did sometimes when venturing out on the desert for only a moment. Hurry, he hissed and led her down the secret crevasse into the hidden cave. "'It will be light soon,' he whispered as he held a door seal open for her. "'The Harkonnens have been making desperation patrols over some of this region. We dare not chance discovery now.' They emerged into the narrow side passage entrance to the cave of birds. Glow globes came alight. Othaim pressed past her, said, "'Follow me quickly now.' They sped down the passage, through another valve door, another passage, and through hangings into what had been the Seadina's alcove in the days when this was an overday rest cave. Rugs and cushions now covered the floor. Woven hangings with the red figure of a hawk hid the rock walls. A low field desk at one side was strewn with papers from which lifted the aroma of their spice origin. The Reverend Mother sat alone directly opposite the entrance. She looked up with the inward stare that made the uninitiated tremble. Othaim pressed palms together, said, I have brought Chani. He bowed, retreated through the hangings. And Jessica thought, How do I tell Chani? How is my grandson? Jessica asked. So it's to be the ritual greeting, Chani thought, and her fears returned. Where is Muad'Dib? Why isn't he here to greet me? He is healthy and happy, my mother, Chani said. I left him with Alia in the care of Hara. My mother, Jessica thought. Yes, she has the right to call me that in the formal greeting. She has given me a grandson. I hear a gift of cloth has been sent from Koanua Siech, Jessica said. It is lovely cloth, Chani said. Does Alia send a message? No message, but the Siech moves more smoothly now that the people are beginning to accept the miracle of her status. Why does she drag this out so? Chani wondered. Something was so urgent that they sent a thopter for me. Now we drag through the formalities. We must have some of the new cloth cut into garments for little Lito, Jessica said. Whatever you wish, my mother, Chani said. She lowered her gaze. Is there news of battles? She held her face expressionless that Jessica might not see the betrayal, that this was a question about Paul Muad'Dib. New victories, Jessica said. Rabban has sent cautious overtures about a truce. His messengers have been returned without their water. Rabban has even lightened the burdens of the people in some of the sink villages, but he is too late. The people know he does it out of fear of us. Thus it goes as Muad'Dib said, Chani said. She stared at Jessica, trying to keep her fears to herself. I have spoken his name, but she has not responded. One cannot see emotion in that glazed stone she calls a face, but she is too frozen. Why is she so still? What has happened to my usul? I wish we were in the south, Jessica said. The oases were so beautiful when we left. Do you not long for the day when the whole land may blossom thus? The land is beautiful, true, Chani said, but there is much grief in it. Grief is the price of victory, Jessica said. 
Is she preparing me for grief? Chana asked herself. She said, There are so many women without men, there was jealousy when it was learned that I'd been summoned north. I summoned you, Jessica said. Chani felt her heart hammering. She wanted to clap her hands to her ears, fearful of what they might hear. Still she kept her voice even. The message was signed Muad'Dib. I signed it thus in the presence of his lieutenants, Jessica said. It was a subterfuge of necessity. And Jessica thought, This is a brave woman, my Pauls. She holds to the niceties even when fear is almost overwhelming her. Yes, she may be the one we need now. Only the slightest tone of resignation crept into Chani's voice as she said, Now you may say the thing that must be said. You were needed here to help me revive Paul, Jessica said. And she thought, there, I said it in the precisely correct way, revive. Thus she knows Paul is alive and knows there is peril all in the same word. Chani took only a moment to calm herself then. What is it I may do? She wanted to leap at Jessica, shake her and scream, take me to him, but she waited silently for the answer. I suspect... Jessica said, that the Harkonnens have managed to send an agent among us to poison Paul. It's the only explanation that seems to fit. A most unusual poison. I've examined his blood in the most subtle ways without detecting it. Chani thrust herself forward onto her knees. Poison? Is he in pain? Could I... He is unconscious, Jessica said. The processes of his life are so low that they can be detected only with the most refined techniques. I shudder to think what could have happened had I not been the one to discover him. He appears dead to the untrained eye. You have reasons other than courtesy for summoning me, Chani said. I know you, Reverend Mother. What is it you think I may do that you cannot do? She is brave, lovely, and... Ah, so perceptive, Jessica thought. She'd have made a fine Bene Gesserit. Chani, Jessica said, you may find this difficult to believe, but I do not know precisely why I sent for you. It was an instinct, a basic intuition. The thought came unbidden, send for Chani, for the first time, Chani saw the sadness in Jessica's expression, the unveiled pain modifying the inward stare. I've done all I know to do, Jessica said. That all, it is so far beyond what is usually supposed as all that you would find difficulty imagining it. Yet, I failed. The old companion, Halleck, Chani asked, is it possible he's a traitor? Not Gurney, Jessica said. The two words carried an entire conversation, and Chani saw the searching, the tests, the memories of old failures that went into this flat denial. Chani rocked back onto her feet, stood up, smoothed her desert-stained robe. Take me to him, she said. Jessica arose, turned through hangings on the left wall. Chani followed found herself in what had been a storeroom, its rock walls concealed now beneath heavy draperies. Paul lay on a field pad against the far wall. A single glow globe above him illuminated his face. A black robe covered him to the chest, leaving his arms outside it stretched along its sides. He appeared to be unclothed under the robe. The skin exposed looked waxen, rigid. There was no visible movement to him. Chani suppressed the desire to dash forward, throw herself across him. She found her thoughts instead going to her son, Leto. And she realized in this instant that Jessica once had faced such a moment, her man, threatened by death, forced in her own mind to consider what might be done to save a young son. The realization formed a sudden bond with the older woman, so that Chani reached out and clasped Jessica's hand. The answering grip was painful in its intensity. 
He lives, Jessica said. I assure you he lives. But the thread of his life is so thin it could easily escape detection. There are some among the leaders already muttering that the mother speaks, and not the reverend mother, that my son is truly dead and I do not want to give up his water to the tribe. How long has he been this way? Chani asked. She disengaged her hand from Jessica's, moved farther into the room. Three weeks, Jessica said. I spent almost a week trying to revive him. There were meetings, arguments, investigations. Then I sent for you. The Fedekin obey my orders, else I might not have been able to delay the... She wet her lips with her tongue, watching Chani cross to Paul. Chani stood over him now, looking down on the soft beard of youth that framed his face, tracing with her eyes the high brow line, the strong nose, the shuttered eyes, the features so peaceful in this rigid repose. How does he take nourishment? Chani asked. The demands of his flesh are so slight he does not yet need food, Jessica said. How many know of what has happened? Chani asked. Only his closest advisers, a few of the leaders, the Fedekin, and, of course, whoever administered the poison. There is no clue to the poisoner? And it's not for want of investigating, Jessica said. What do the Fedekin say? Chani asked. They believe Paul is in a sacred trance, gathering his holy powers before the final battles. This is a thought I've cultivated. Chani lowered herself to her knees beside the pad, bent close to Paul's face. She sensed an immediate difference in the air about his face, but it was only the spice, the ubiquitous spice whose odor permeated everything in Fremen life. Still... You were not born to the spice as we were, Chani said. Have you investigated the possibility that his body has rebelled against too much spice in his diet? Allergy reactions are all negative, Jessica said. She closed her eyes, as much to blot out this scene as because of sudden realization of fatigue. How long have I been without sleep? She asked herself. Too long. When you change the water of life, Chani said, you do it within yourself by the inward awareness. Have you used this awareness to test his blood? Normal Fremen blood, Jessica said, completely adapted to the diet and the life here. Chani sat back on her heels, submerging her fears in thought as she studied Paul's face. This was a trick she had learned from watching the Reverend Mother's. Time could be made to serve the mind. One concentrated the entire attention. Presently, Chani said, Is there a maker here? There are several, Jessica said with a touch of weariness. We are never without them these days. Each victory requires its blessing, each ceremony before a raid. But Paul Moadib has held himself aloof from these ceremonies. Chani said. Jessica nodded to herself, remembering her son's ambivalent feelings toward the spice drug and the prescient awareness it precipitated. How did you know this? Jessica asked. It is spoken. Too much is spoken, Jessica said bitterly. Get me the raw water of the maker, Chani said. Jessica stiffened at the tone of command in Chani's voice, then observed the intense concentration in the younger woman and said, At once. She went out through the hangings to send a waterman. Chani sat staring at Paul. If he has tried to do this, she thought, and it's the sort of thing he might try. Jessica knelt beside Chani, holding out a plain camp ewer. The charged odor of the poison was sharp in Chani's nostrils. She dipped a finger in the fluid, held the finger close to Paul's nose. The skin along the bridge of his nose wrinkled slightly. Slowly the nostrils flared. Jessica gasped. Chani touched the dampened finger to Paul's upper lip. He drew in a long, sobbing breath. What is this? Jessica demanded. Be still. Chani said, you must convert a small amount of the sacred water, quickly. 
Without questioning, because she recognized the tone of awareness in Chani's voice, Jessica lifted the ewer to her mouth, drew in a small sip. Paul's eyes flew open. He stared upward at Chani. "'It is not necessary for her to change the water,' he said. His voice was weak but steady. Jessica, a sip of the fluid on her tongue, found her body rallying, converting the poison almost automatically. In the light elevation the ceremony always imparted, she sensed the life glow from Paul, a radiation there registering on her senses. In that instant she knew. "'You drank the sacred water,' she blurted. "'One drop of it,' Paul said. "'So small, one drop.' "'How could you do such a foolish thing?' she demanded. "'He is your son,' Chani said. Jessica glared at her. A rare smile, warm and full of understanding, touched Paul's lips. "'Hear, my beloved,' he said. "'Listen to her, mother. She knows.' "'A thing that others can do, he must do,' Chani said. "'When I had the drop in my mouth, "'when I felt it and smelled it, "'when I knew what it was doing to me, "'then I knew I could do the thing that you have done,' he said. "'Your Bene Gesserit proctors speak of the Kwisatz Haderach, "'but they cannot begin to guess the many places I have been. "'In the few minutes I... He broke off, looking at Chani with a puzzled frown. Chani, how did you get here? You're supposed to be. Why are you here? He tried to push himself onto his elbows. Chani pressed him back gently. Please, my Uso, she said. I feel so weak, he said. His gaze darted around the room. How long have I been here? You've been three weeks in a coma so deep that the spark of life seemed to have fled, Jessica said. But it was... I took it just a moment ago, and... A moment for you. Three weeks of fear for me, Jessica said. It was only one drop, but I converted it, Paul said. I changed the water of life. And before Chani or Jessica could stop him, he dipped his hand into the ewer they had placed on the floor beside him, and he brought the dripping hand to his mouth, swallowed the palm-cupped liquid. Paul! Jessica screamed. He grabbed her hand, faced her with a death's head grin, and he sent his awareness surging over her. The rapport was not as tender, not as sharing, not as encompassing as it had been with Alia and with the old reverend mother in the cavern. But it was a rapport a sense-sharing of the entire being. It shook her, weakened her, and she cowered in her mind, fearful of him. Aloud, he said, You speak of a place where you cannot enter. This place which the Reverend Mother cannot face, show it to me. She shook her head, terrified by the very thought. Show it to me, he commanded. No, but she could not escape him. Bludgeoned by the terrible force of him, she closed her eyes and focused inward, the direction that is dark. Paul's consciousness flowed through and around her and into the darkness. She glimpsed the place dimly before her mind blanked itself away from the terror. Without knowing why, her whole being trembled at what she had seen a region where a wind blew and sparks glared, where rings of light expanded and contracted, where rows of tumescent white shapes flowed over and under and around the lights, driven by darkness and a wind out of nowhere. Presently she opened her eyes, saw Paul staring up at her. He still held her hand, but the terrible rapport was gone. She quieted her trembling. Paul released her hand. It was as though some crutch had been removed. She staggered up and back, would have fallen had not Chani jumped to support her. Reverend Mother, Chani said, what is wrong? Tired, Jessica whispered. So tired. Here, Chani said, sit here. She helped Jessica to a cushion against the wall. The strong young arms felt so good to Jessica, she clung to Chani. He has, in truth, seen the water of life? Chani asked. 
she disengaged herself from Jessica's grip. He has seen, Jessica whispered. Her mind still rolled and surged from the contact. It was like stepping to solid land after weeks on a heaving sea. She sensed the old reverend mother within her, and all the others awakened and questioning, What was that? What happened? Where was that place? Through it all threaded the realization that her son was the Kwisatz Haderach, the one who could be many places at once. He was the fact out of the Bene Gesserit dream, and the fact gave her no peace. What happened? Chani demanded. Jessica shook her head. Paul said, There is in each of us an ancient force that takes and an ancient force that gives. A man finds little difficulty facing that place within himself where the taking force dwells, but it's almost impossible for him to see into the giving force without changing into something other than man. For a woman the situation is reversed. Jessica looked up, found Chani was staring at her while listening to Paul. Do you understand me, mother? Paul asked. She could only nod. These things are so ancient within us, Paul said, that they are ground into each separate cell of our bodies. We're shaped by such forces. You can say to yourself, yes, I see how such a thing may be, but when you look inward and confront the raw force of your own life unshielded, you see your peril. You see that this could overwhelm you. The greatest peril to the giver is the force that takes. The greatest peril to the taker is the force that gives. It's as easy to be overwhelmed by giving as by taking. And you, my son, Jessica asked, are you one who gives or one who takes? I'm at the fulcrum, he said. I cannot give without taking, and I cannot take without... He broke off, looking to the wall at his right. Chani felt a draft against her cheek, turned to see the hangings close. It was Othame, Paul said. He was listening. Accepting the words, Chani was touched by some of the prescience that haunted Paul and she knew a thing yet to be as though it already had occurred. Othame would speak of what he had seen and heard. Others would spread the story until it was a fire over the land. Paul Muadib is not as other men, they would say. There can be no more doubt. He is a man, yet he sees through to the water of life in the way of a reverend mother. He is indeed the Lisan al-Gaib. You have seen the future, Paul. Jessica said. Will you say what you've seen? Not the future, he said. I've seen the now. He forced himself to a sitting position, waved Chani aside as she moved to help him. The space above Arrakis is filled with the ships of the guild. Jessica trembled at the certainty in his voice. The Padishah Emperor himself is there, Paul said. He looked at the rock ceiling of his cell. With his favorite truth-sayer and five legions of Sardukar. The old baron Vladimir Harkonnen is there with Thufir Hawat beside him and seven ships jammed with every conscript he could muster. Every great house has its raiders above us waiting. Chani shook her head, unable to look away from Paul. His strangeness, the flat tone of voice, the way he looked through her, filled her with awe. Jessica tried to swallow in a dry throat, said, For what are they waiting? Paul looked at her. For the guild's permission to land. The guild will strand on Arrakis any force that lands without permission. The guild's protecting us? Jessica asked. Protecting us. The guild itself caused this by spreading tales about what we do here and by reducing troop transport fares to a point where even the poorest houses are up there now waiting to loot us. Jessica noted the lack of bitterness in his tone, wondered at it. She couldn't doubt his words. They had that same intensity she'd seen in him the night he'd revealed the path of the future that had taken them among the Fremen. Paul took a deep breath, said, 
Mother, you must change a quantity of the water for us. We need the catalyst. Chani, have a scout force sent out to find a pre-spice mass. If we plant a quantity of the water of life, 